Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Shawnee High School and to our PLTW Engineering, Design, and Development Capstone Project presentations. The Engineering, Design, and Development course is a capstone in our PLTW, which is Project Lead the Way, uh, high school engineering program. This course is an open-ended engineering research course in which students work individually or in teams to design and develop an original solution to a well-defined and justified open-ended problem by applying an engineering design process. Students perform research to select, define, and justify a problem. After carefully defining the design requirements and creating multiple solution approaches, students select an approach, create, and test their prototype solution. While progressing through the engineering design process, students worked to hone their organizational, communication, and interpersonal skills, their creative and problem-solving abilities, and their understanding of the design process. And tonight, the students will have an opportunity to present and defend their original solution to you here. Um, I am now going to call to the stage Ms. Heather Zanakis, our Director of Curriculum for the Lenape Regional High School District, and she has a few more um, words to start the program. Ms. Zanakis? Thank you, Mr. Bookwalter. Good evening, everyone, and I want to welcome you and thank you for coming out tonight. On behalf of our Lenape Regional High School District Board of Education and District Administration, we want to welcome you, and we want to welcome several people who are with us tonight. Tonight joining us, we have Board of Education member Steve Lee. We have our superintendent, Dr. Carol Birnbaum, your principal, Mr. Matt Campbell, Supervisor of Science, Business, and Technology, who you already met, Mr. Craig Bookwalter. And we have our PLTW teachers, Scott Harris, Lisa Burson, Jen Pulliam, and Dylan Fields. We would also like to thank our sponsors who have contributed generously to this program, Project Lead the Way, Lockheed Martin, and BAE Systems. Tonight is a monumental occasion for these students. This is the culmination of four years together as one cohort, the first Project Lead the Way class and the first Project Lead the Way class at Shawnee High School, which will pave the way for many students to come. They began this journey together as freshmen, probably not knowing exactly what would lie ahead, and here they are now, four years later, together, ready to show their friends and their family their designs and their thoughts and their process. So to the students, I want to say congratulations. Well done. Way to make it through the four years. Congratulations on what lies ahead in your future. And we're excited to hear from you and see your design in action. Next, it is my pleasure to introduce the first group of students, Josh Lamb, Margo Hansen, and Carl Hauser. Thank you. Hello everyone, we are Versatool. I'm Margo. I'm Carl. I'm Josh. Okay, so our initial problem was that multi-tools, they're pretty useful, but sometimes not useful enough. If you have one with only a few tools, you're compelled to go out and buy another one. But we wanted to fix that. And multi-tools are often used by craftsmen, hunters, industrial workers, and campers in order to have a variety of tools in one compact device. However, inserting more relevant and removing unnecessary tools is difficult and time-consuming. So our goal was to combine an array of tools with customization and have a lower price as well. There were some similar products out in the market. The first one is the Quirky Switch. It has 12 to 24 parts that can be added and removed, but the reviews online said that it was poorly constructed. 
The second one was the DJ multi-tool, which houses the tools within itself, and it cannot easily, easily add or remove parts. The third one is the Leatherman Tread, and this is a more expensive multi-tool, at least $140, and you can add or remove any of the 29 parts, but it's expensive and gets tangled in itself. We released a survey, mostly to students, professions, mostly students, a few teachers, engineers, and we asked about our main goal, how would the ability to change parts on a multi-tool influence your decision to purchase one? And a small positive change <laughs> inspired us to make that leap and make the verse tool. Now the tools that everyone wanted, mostly a screwdriver, a file, scissors, wire cutters, and a wrench. And plenty of people put down knife, but that's not allowed because this is school. And one prankster put down steel pan mallets and conductor's baton. We decided to narrow down our needs and wants, so we went with changing parts because that is the whole goal of this, ergonomics and safety. Uh, some of our wants were it would be nice to be able to store the parts internally instead of having an outside carrying case that you have to lug around. And of course, who wouldn't want it to be affordable and also durable? So these are the designs that we came up with. Um, just our initial, just throwing the ideas out there and later we made uh, refined sketches. So our first idea, Josh's, um, is a handle that it uh, uses magnets and uh, a clamp to pull the parts in and hold it there while you're using it. Margo's idea is more of your traditional multi-tool where you have two folding pieces of a handle that open into pliers and then you can open that handle, like those little bits that can come out that you can then put the parts on. And then the idea that we went with, which was the idea that I designed, was more like uh, a traditional Swiss Army knife where you have two uh, rods that can fold out that you can then put your parts on. And they were, my idea was to have them be hex rods so that you can still rotate like, with the screwdriver and things without it slipping or becoming undone. So these were the CAD files that I end up, ended up drawing where we have the body is on one side where you, we would have two of them and they would fit into each other and lock in and then the axle would be the actual rotating part. Now, I did have to change a little bit from our initial designs. Uh, the piece that those parts would go onto ended up, I had to make it round instead of the hex rod because of uh, limitations with the 3D printer. It wasn't quite precise enough for the hexagon shapes. And then that was it when it's fully built with a flathead screwdriver and a Phillips head on it. All right, now we're gonna go into our testing and results. Uh, so we performed three tests, and one of them I'm doing right now. Putting the multi-tool in the pocket and walking around with it. <laughs> um, these pockets are very deep though, so it was very comfortable in these, but most pockets are not this deep, and uh, it's just very uncomfortable. It's pretty big, this is a five inch thing. That's not very comfortable, so overall, it could have been better, and it, it was pretty much not good, so probably would have to make it smaller. Um, now there's the second test, as you can see up there, where we threw the multi-tool to each other and see how easily it was to catch. That was basically just to see if it felt comfortable to hold and we can easily catch it quickly. That was pretty much a success, as you can see from Mark's smiling face back there. Hi, Mark. Um, and then the third test um, was the drop test. Now, the drop test did not go great. Um, if you want, I can show you. Yeah. <laughs> so that was a failure. It survived like 0.75 meters drops, but anything above a meter, that would just happen. So obviously, that was also a failure. Um, so what would we do differently? Well, one thing that was a big problem for us was um, we would need to spend more time coming up with ideas because 
about a month later, we're like, oh man, wouldn't it be great if we did this instead? But by then it was too late. We've already done so much research into this. And, <laughs> and um, it, we couldn't go back on it. Uh, we would also create the prototype itself earlier. Um, we came into many problems putting the tool together because the 3D printer would just not fit well. <laughs> the, um, the, what's the word I'm looking for? What's the word? What's the word? Um, there's a word I can't remember. Tolerance, thank you, Matt. The tolerance of it was not very good, and we tried to line it up, and it just wouldn't. Um, we would also make it out of metal, because that test clearly would have worked if it was out of metal, but this is what we get instead. So yeah. And so th uh, that was our initial prototype that we did the testing with. I later printed a second one. Um, as you can see here, it's orange instead of white. So the whole idea, we've got this one tool here that we don't need to use anymore. So you can take it off and replace it with another one. So you can just rotate whenever you need. Um, also, I think part of the reason that that failed when you drop it is because we initially just hot glued it together because it's what we had on hand. I'm not dropping this one, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> um, this one I used uh, model cement on, so it binds the plastic stronger than just hot glue. So hopefully this would survive more, but I don't really want to drop it. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Any questions? Um, we only have, so we have two prongs that are designed into it, but the idea would be that you can have as many tools as you need that would be able to fit onto it. You just carry it separately. Thank you. Who's the next So next we're gonna have the backspace. Hello, everybody. Thank you all for coming. We are Backspace. And this is the Backspace team. I'm Rachel Blanco. I'm Kira Mortensen. And I'm Mary Schofield. All right, so when we were first tasked with coming up with a product that we wanted to spend the year designing, uh, we thought about would, what would be most applicable to us as students. Um, and so something that we all thought we could relate to was sitting in school desks. Um, because we do that seven hours a day on average, um, and we found that we were experiencing some level of discomfort, and so we wanted to create something that would address that problem. So our problem statement is that students spend approximately seven hours a day sitting in uncomfortable or incorrectly sized desks. This causes students back pain, which in turn inhibits the learning process. Students need more suitable seating for prolonged usage. So as I said, we wanted to create something that would make sitting in school desks more comfortable. So first, we had to take a look at current school desk options. We found out that most school desks were designed primarily for two reasons. They're inexpensive and they're indestructible. So schools can implement a lot of them throughout their classrooms and they won't break and they'll last a long time. However, this is often uncomfortable for the student and provides little to no back support and does not promote a healthy posture, which can all affect the student's performance in the classroom. So we took those issues with school desks into consideration and decided that the best product we could create to address them would be a seat cushion. So we took a look at the products that are out uh, in the market currently, and we found that the majority of them are meant for desk chairs, uh, car seats, just regular chairs. Uh, they weren't made specifically for school desks, so we wanted to create something that would be. Um, we also found that the majority of them were separate pieces, so they were either only a back cushion or only a seat cushion. And we wanted to create one that combined both 
um, to provide the most amount of support and comfort for students. Um, we also found that the ones out there that were combined were a little too bulky to fit in our desks, so we needed to create one that would fit within the dimensions of our desks. Um, we also found that a lot of ex uh, options are too expensive. Um, a less expensive product would fit better within a school's budget and be, be, uh, be able to be uh, implemented on a wider scale within schools and therefore be more accessible to students. Uh, so now we're going to go into the research that went into justifying and supporting uh, the creation of our product. Um, so we sent out a survey to over 100 students to ask them about their daily experiences sitting in a school desk. So we found that the majority of them spend between five and six hours a day seated in a desk, which is a pretty long duration of time. Um, over three quarters of them found that school desks are uncomfortable, and nearly three quarters said that school desks actually cause them pain. Um, and the combination of that discomfort and the pain caused uh, resulted in difficulty to focus while uh, sitting in a school desk for the majority of our respondents. So when deciding what exactly what we wanted our product to look like and what uh, specifications we wanted to have, we came up with list, a list of needs and wants. Um, so our first need that we had was to provide better back support and promote better posture, because as we just said with our survey, we found that a lot of students are uncomfortable and then this uh, discomfort inhibits their learning process and they're not able to focus as well in school. Um, and promoting better back posture is something that will last you for, life, uh, for your, the rest of your life. Um, our second need was that we wanted it to be attachable and removable to allow for cleaning. Um, so since we are using this for schools, we want to make sure that we're prom promoting proper hygiene. Um, so we wanted to at least have a cover that would come off of our cushion that we could just throw, in the uh, throw into the washing machine um, and allow for easy cleaning. Uh, and then our third need was for it to be adjustable to varying body types. Because as we said, we are focusing on schools and students, um, and students come in all different ages, so we wanted it to, our product to definitely accommodate everyone. And some of our wants, our first want is to facilitate active sitting. Active sitting is the body's natural need for movement and allows people to stay more engaged and focused. Our second want was for it to be affordable to purchase and implement so schools can implement the cushion on a wide scale and um, in their limited budget. Our third want was for it to be eco-friendly because most cushions are made of materials that are harmful to the environment and we want our product to help the environment and be sustainable. So now we're going to talk about the process uh, we went through when coming up with initial concepts for our design. Um, so each of our team members created a sketch uh, of a product that we thought would best satisfy our needs and wants. Um, so each of these revolve around the same concept. It's a combination of a back cushion and a seat cushion, both created out of shaped foam and able to be attached to a school desk. To determine which concept would be most effective in um, addressing our needs and wants, we used a decision matrix which calculates the strengths and weaknesses of each concept. Um, so using this decision matrix, we figured out that concept one had the strongest score. Um, however, we also, the, each concept had its own strengths and weaknesses, so we took pieces of each concept to come up with our final design. Um, and as you can see, this is the initial sketch of our final design. So we used this sketch to, um, throughout the rest of the building process as our first step of what we wanted our product to look like. Um, so the requirements we had for it was that it was dimensioned according to school desks. Uh, the seat cushion was contoured. Um, the seat cushion bottom, we wanted to cinch to the bottom of a desk chair so that when you sit on it, it doesn't slide forward. The back cushion was supposed to be shaped for spinal support um, to promote better posture, as we were saying before. And there was a buckle that we wanted to uh, affix the cushion to the backrest of a school desk. All right, so now we're going to move into the steps we took to actually turn our design concept into a physical prototype. Um, and we began doing this by using CAD software to create 3D models. So this is the model of our seat cushion. You can see that it's contoured um, on the upper portion of the cushion, and the footprint of the cushion matches the seat of the school desk. And this is our model for the back cushion. So this angle here is meant to align with that of the spine in order to promote good, comfortable posture. So some materials we use to design our product is high density foam and memory foam for the cushion, adhesive spray, cotton fabric for the cover, uh, side release buckle, and Velcro dots. And the tools we used to put it all together was an electric knife, a sewing machine, and needle and thread. 
Um, so these are some pictures from our initial building days. Um, so as you can see, we're using high-density foam there that Rachel mentioned as our materials. Um, and we used the CAD software, or the CAD models that Kira created, um, and we printed them out at full scale, and we used them to trace onto the high-density foam. Uh, and we're cutting out using the electric knife. And then this is a picture of our initial model with um, no cover on it. So as you can see, the bottom layer here is that high-density foam that I was talking about, which is a little bit firmer and doesn't compress quite as much. Um, and then this top layer here is the memory foam, which is softer and is more for cushioning. Um, and as we said, it is contoured, as you can see. Um, So these images show the covers that we created for the cushions. Um, each of them has an inner white cover that is permanent, um, that is meant to just protect the foam. And they both have an outer navy blue cover. Um, and that has a Velcro uh, closure, so it's ably, uh, <laughs> able to be easily removed and just thrown in the washing machine to get clean. Um, you can also see uh, how the buckle is attached to the back. Um, and that's also able to be removed uh, prior to washing. So after months of researching, designing, and building, we were able to create our final prototype. So first we have our seat cushion, modeled by Mary. Um, so we have a front, um, a front view, you can't really see the contour with the cover on, a top view and a side view of it, and Mary will show you how to put it on the desk. And next we have our back cushion. Um, so we have, again, a top view, a front and side view, and the side view you can see how it is curved for the spine and a, and a back view with the buckle. So now that we have our prototype, we had to test it to prove that it fulfilled our problem statement. Our main test was a seated test, so this involved students of all ages, genders, and body types. Um, some students would carry around the cushion all day and use it in every single class, and sub students use it um, on an hourly basis or class basis. And afterwards, they filled out a survey for us relating on their experience using our product. Um, so these are the results of the survey that we sent out to each participant post-trial. Um, you can see that the majority of participants said that they felt that their posture was somewhat or totally improved while they were seated. Um, also, the majority felt that their sitting experience was improved while they were using our cushion. Um, and also, the majority rated the quality of their posture during the trial uh, at a four out of five or above. So we consider these results uh, generally positive. However, through our testing process, we saw that our product wasn't perfect and there were some improvements that had to be made. On the survey we gave out, we had a feedback section, and um, there a big majority of the people said that the cushion was too bulky and the back didn't provide the support we intended it to. However, they did also rate our product, and all the ratings were a six or above, so we rate that as a success. So when reflecting back on our final prototype and the year long that we spent uh, developing it, we did uh, come up with some problems and improvements that we would fix if we were to remake or continue prototyping. Um, so the biggest one that we, well, one of the biggest ones that we saw was that the seat cushion cover, we initially said that we wanted it to be cinched to the bottom of the seat so that it wouldn't slide forward. Um, when developing, we tried something new and we used uh, sticky dots, kind of, that would just um, make it stick to the seat. We found that they fell off very quickly, so each time it was tested, a few more would fall off. So if we were to redo this, we would try rubber dots would be a little bit more um, uh, sturdy and would hold up more, hopefully, or we could try cin actually cinching the bottom like we had initially planned to do. Um, another issue that we came into was that the back cushion, we used high density foam for the majority of the back cushion, which we found was a little too firm. Um, and it also, uh, the angle is a little too great to make it comfortable for uh, posture and for sitting. Um, so if we were to remake, we would decrease that angle and use maybe um, a medium density foam or a more memory foam for the majority of it instead of the high, uh, the high density foam that we used. Um, and we also found that the seat cushion was a little too thick and it elevated the seat a lot. I don't know if you can see, um, but it, it, there is quite a bit of elevation there. And once you sit on it, it does compress quite a bit, but getting in and out is kind of awkward. Um, and in, in addition with the back cushion that does protrude a little bit, we wanted to, we would decrease all of that so that it was easier to get in and out of the seat. Does anyone have any questions? No? Yes. 
Um, we did not, but it's just a cotton cover that we had sewn on. Uh, we didn't really have time to do that, but that's something that we could do very quickly to make sure that it holds up. But it's just cotton that we bought, so, yes. Yes, yeah, so as you can see, we did the buckle so that we could move it up and down. Um, as I said, the seat cushion was a little too thick, so it doesn't allow for it too much, but if we were to lower that, then the buckle allows it to be um, tightened depending on where it is on the back. Any more? Okay. Thank you for listening. We are Backspace. Um, uh, the next group is ProTech with JC, Joey, and Jackson. What's up, everyone? My name is JC Dovis. This is Jackson Dyson. This is Joey Moore, and we are ProTech. So, at the start of the year, we came up with a problem statement, and in football, there's a lot of, a lot of concussions from head impact, and later on, this leads to CTE, which is a major deficit for football players and their families as, uh, as they finish their careers and later in their lifetime. So, we came up with a product to hopefully uh, diminish the amount of concussions that are um, sustained in football. And a couple, these are a couple sources that uh, we found to back up the problem statement. Uh, this one, out of 202 brains of deceased football players uh, studied, CTE was diagnosed in 177 of them, which is a staggering number to find in professional athletes and how they uh, live their life after their careers. Another one is just the amount of reported concussions in football preseason and during the season, which is also a staggering number to the, um, the health of the players. And another, uh, just to show the, the, the insufficiency of a helmet to, pre to prevent concussions in uh, the players. And so, and so in similar patents, um, this one is kind of seen in college campuses. You'll see it, it's kind of similar to ours. It's more of a, based on the, um, to prevent impact to the helmet rather than how ours is designed is to uh, decrease the amount of friction uh, the helmet sustains on impact. This one is seen in college campuses, widely used. It's, it's, it's pretty, pretty solid, <laughs> pretty solid uh, patent. So this one here, JC. I don't need mics. Where do I have? So uh, what's similar about our design and the design is that both of them are kind of an outer shell that you fit onto the top of the helmet like a sock. Uh, but what's different about ours from this one is that um, Ours is meant to reduce the friction on impact, whereas this design is meant to reduce the force on impact. The helmet. Okay. And so this this patent is what Shawnee Football uses as our as our football helmets, and it's it's the, the the helmet itself. And what it does, it's to prevent impact head on, uh, in collision, and as opposed to having protection all the way around. It's just regular helmet all the way around, but in the front there's a pad cushion that takes away the impact directly head on. And so uh, the obvious um, differences from our product and this product is that ours is a cover for the helmet rather than the actual helmet, but it's all, all towards the same goal of preventing concussions. And so we took a couple surveys throughout the year, and here are a couple of them showing the uh, amount of concussions suffered by high school athletes and athletes at Shawnee who believe they may have suffered a concussion or have suffered a concussion and how, they, how people will think it'll affect the game of football in the future and the effects of CTE on people. And so our basic consensus from these surveys was that um, high school football and football all around is becoming dangerous from the concussions, but and there needs to be a uh, product made to prevent these injuries. And as uh, time goes on, football may be uh, poorly Looked, on, looked upon because of concussions and how people are dealing with them in their later on careers. All right, so before we begin designing a uh, prototype 
to deal with this problem, we had to identify some needs and wants for our product. So we uh, needed it to be durable, lightweight, and low profile. Um, it has to obviously be able to withstand multiple impacts and has to last through games. Um, it has to be lightweight so that it doesn't really interfere with players as they try to uh, play the game and low profile so that it allows for full range of motion. And we wanted it to be affordable, aesthetically pleasing, and easy to use. Um, obviously, since this is such a major issue, um, it has to be an affordable option for uh, schools, universities, the NFL to purchase. Um, it has to be as we wanted it to be aesthetically pleasing because we didn't really want it to interfere with like the designs on the football helmets, or we wanted uh, people to be able to design their own things to put on it. And uh, for ease of use, we wanted it to be small and light, and we wanted it to be easy to uh, put on and take off as it has to be for players to be able to function in the game. And so here we have a diagram um, of all our wants and needs, and it's just going very specifically into what uh, we decided to go for to meet these wants and needs. And so this is our sketch that our group decided upon. Um, some differences between this sketch and our final prototype include that uh, on the sketch we have places for uh, fasteners through buttons, but we decided to go with Velcro fastening in our final prototype. And there's also different places where we, uh, in our sketch for uh, sewing and stapling that we omitted in our final product prototype. And so here we have our uh, inventor file with the part file that is just to show that it can take on a helmet shape in a 3D. And on the right is our sketch, which shows the dimensions for our prototype, which just we dimensioned it to fit a standard football helmet. All right, so as we go into our test results, you can see that we have two prototypes. Uh, prototype A, which was the one that we did beforehand, right here, it's kind of, it, we, this was our first attempt at the, at the prototype, so it doesn't really cover the full helmet. So we took what we learned making this one and made a new one to kind of more uh, efficiently prove our problem statement. So this one covers the whole helmet. It's better fastened and has better test results overall. So the first thing we did in testing was we wanted to test uh, the strength of the stitching material on the outside of uh, each prototype. And what we did to do this is we attached a force meter um, to that stitching on each different prototype and pulled it to, our, to the breaking point. And what we came across is that prototype A was able to um, withstand more of that force, making it the more durable stitching. The more durable stitching. Um, our next, next test is we wanted to test, test the durability of the elastic component in each prototype. And so to do this is we, we took each of the prototypes off the helmet and stretched them um, to their breaking point. And so what we found is that prototype A um, was able to uh, stretch from 8 inches up to 12 inches, and prototype B was able to stretch from 9 inches to 14 inches, making prototype B um, the prototype with more durable elastic. So next, uh, we decided to test the strength of the stitching used to attach the elastic band uh, to the helmet. And what we found in this test is that what we found in this test is that sewing it, the elastic strip, to the material was a lot more effective in a, a lot more durable in holding up, whereas stapling it was not nearly as effective. Uh, so the sewing ended up stretching a lot further, but it neither stretched to the desired distance we wanted. So for this test, we kind of make an we made an apparatus that you'll see in the video that kind of tested the helmets on impact. And so what, what they did on impact was helmet set up here is kind of offset so they collide on the side to test the friction of each helmet and the uh, and the shell so first we have the base test and then the prototype A on a regular helmet and then prototype B and so what you're looking for is to see how far the helmets slide past one another the farther they slide the less friction there is therefore less impact on the helmet So this is the base test, which is just the helmet on helmet without any of the prototypes applied. 
And as you can see, it slides to a certain degree, and then we have compare, uh, we compare the distances of sliding on the next slide. After that, I'll show you the, uh, the tests. And this is prototype A, the one that we did before making the revised product. And this is prototype B, which was overall our best uh, prototype. And so with the base test, you can kind of see, just comparing the arrows, uh, all the pixels are at the same height and distance, so it just, the distance between the arrows shows how far they slid compared to one, one another. So this is the base test of the first video with just the helmet. And then this is prototype B, which has the largest gap between the two, so the less friction between the two helmets and prototype. And prototype A with the least amount of uh, space between the two. So prototype A was basically what we made to begin with, and then we based prototype B off of that with minor uh, or major um, differences to overall enhance the product. So uh, in reflection, I think the biggest issue we came across is that concussion research is such a widely researched topic today that it was hard for us to come up with our own creative idea, um, just because there's so many things already out there. Um, another issue we came across was during the assembly process that we found the integrity of the material made it difficult to measure how much material we needed for each prototype, which is why that first prototype uh, looks a little smaller in the back and doesn't cover as much surface area. And then the third uh, biggest problem we came, uh, came across was it was difficult for us to test the impact force um, and test the friction on impact due to the fact that we kind of lacked a device um, with the resources we had to measure that impact. All right, any questions? Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely something we could use. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Matt? So, aside from the, the major differences between the, well, the question was what were the major differences between prototype A and prototype B? So, prototype A we made first covers less surface area and it's kind of a different material than what we use for prototype B. And this one obviously covers more surface area. And as you can see in the test, the material uh, provided less, less friction to make it less impact on the player. All right, thank you. And uh, <laughs> next we have, uh, next we have Gabe and Alex with Aqualand. Hello everyone, my name is Gabe, and with me today is Alex. We represent Aqua LA, and uh, throughout this presentation we're gonna talk about how we came up with a problem, um, and then create an idea of how we solved this problem, created a product, and then also what we learned from the experience. So obviously to start off the year, we created a list of problems, and then we did some preliminary research to figure out and reduce this list to figure out what would be worth following, and then in groups we decided on a final problem to pursue. 
Yeah, and so looking through different problems, uh, we chose to go with one that was um, actually very personal to us, and that's that drinking water is hard. Um, it sounds ridiculous when you say it, but actually we found through our research that about 40% of people in America do not consume the proper amount of water for their body type and their activity level. Um, so this is our problem statement. Um, studies have shown that the average water consumption rate in America is significantly lower than the recommended due to forgetfulness. Uh, dehydration can significantly impact uh, mental and physical performance, uh, which hinders productivity. Uh, so then we chose to go through a few different patents that tried to tackle this issue. Uh, the first one that we found was this one, which is essentially for a smart water bottle. Um, the idea behind the smart water bottle is that it tracks intake um, and it provides reminders through the phone or whatever other device you'd like to sync it with, a Fitbit, um, and then you can receive those reminders uh, periodically throughout the day. We actually did find that one of our classmates even had this product um, and it seemed to be very effective. Uh, so this is one solution that we did not want to try to tackle in a similar way. Um, the other product was uh, a water bottle, as you can see up there, with very simple uh, markings to remind you at various points in the day when you should have had uh, certain amounts to drink. Uh, we found that this one was too active. It required the users to actively take part in using the water bottle and looking at it. Uh, we wanted something that was a little bit more passive that you could just receive the reminders for, and that was it. So part of our research, we sent out a survey to a bunch of students, teachers, and just anybody else who'd answered the survey. And uh, we asked them, one of the first questions we asked was if, uh, how much water they were drinking. And uh, they all self-reported, so that could be a source of error. But um, we found that about 33% of people were drinking a liter or less of water a day, and 60% of people were drinking uh, two liters or less a day, and two liters is pretty much what's recommended. Uh, we also asked them if they felt any symptoms of dehydration, uh, thirsty, dry mouth, and many people who took a survey said that they were feeling these kind of symptoms. We also just asked if they felt they were dehydrated or not during the day, and we found that 40% of people did say that they felt dehydrated. And then also if uh, we asked if they felt like they weren't properly hydrated, why that was, and a significant amount of people answered that they felt like they were dehydrated because they were forgetting to drink water. Yeah, and so that brought us to our design goal. Um, we wanted a solution that would effectively promote hydration in the users in a way that would integrate well into the user's daily life. So we wanted something that would be pretty easy to just set on your desk, forget about it, and then it would periodically give you reminders, something that, something that would easily integrate um, into your life. <laughs> Sorry about that. So then we generated our list of needs. Obviously, we needed to help the user um, achieve optimum hydration levels, because that is the main goal of our product. Um, we wanted it to be easy and simple to use. That goes with the integration into the user's life in an easy way. And we wanted it to be water resistant in the case of possible spills or any other complications with your drink. Um, and also so that you could just wash the top of it if you wanted to take it off without harming the internal electrical components. <clears throat> and then we have our list of wants. Um, so we wanted it to be durable and resilient. Uh, we wanted it to track long-term consumption, possibly, so that we could generate more tailored reminders and also collect like widespread data, uh, which we could then use to improve our product. Uh, we wanted it to be aesthetically pleasing so that you could leave it on your desk and it wouldn't be an object of disdain or um, something that would look out of place. And we wanted it to be affordable um, so that the average person could have this in their life and, and use it to, um, effectively. So with this criteria of what we were trying to create, we went about uh, brainstorming possible solutions to this problem. Um, it varied in, uh, Alex and I both created a bunch of ideas, and they varied from design in a separate attachment that you could attach onto the water bottle, an idea that where it was just the water bottle itself. Uh, and then eventually, we, um, we ended up putting them into a decision matrix to figure out which one we felt like would be best to tackle and to um, follow throughout the rest of the year. And that's when we decided to follow the idea of making a coaster. Um, the idea that we, we chose this because we felt like not only was it a bit unique, I mean, no one had really, we've never really heard of a coaster that reminded you to drink water. Maybe there was a reason for that, but, <laughs> but uh, we decided it would be a fun thing to, chow, uh, to do anyway. And so we created a, a bunch of CAD drawings of the basic container, and then throughout the year um, we ended up adding to this, and, uh, and the idea was that we'd have an Arduino and a load cell inside with an amplifier, and the load cell would be able to uh, detect the weight of the water above it, and then it would use calculations from the Arduino to calculate how much water you've been drinking and then if you've been keeping up with what you should be drinking. 
So our goal was to create this basic container so it was big enough to hold everything, ins everything inside and also so that the Lozo could actually detect the weight. So throughout the year we made some revisions to it where we added uh, magnet holes, possibly so uh, it could be open and closed and you know, the magnets would keep it closed. And then also we decided to add these little uh, peg nibs which would uh, be for the load cell so that the load cell could sit in there and it could detect the weight of what's above it because the load cell pretty much had to hold the entire weight of the top part of the container. That way it could actually detect the weight because if it wasn't, then we wouldn't be able to get a reading in the Arduino. So our final design involved something that looked like this. We had two cases, we had everything inside. It seemed to fit together and then we decided to go to testing and uh, <laughs> in testing, I think this might be better to call what went wrong because we learned a lot about what uh, went wrong in our design. <laughs> so one of the first things we found out is due to fabrication um, delays and uh, problems, we ended up getting our final top piece really late in the year. And when we tried to um, fit this together with our bottom piece, we found out that it didn't really fit together. And obviously this is a problem because if it doesn't fit together, it's hard to check if it works because uh, the load cell wouldn't fit on or anything like that. And we kind of thought this might be a problem. We'd even in the design uh, increased the clearance uh, in the, um, later in the year, um, and still when we printed it out, it didn't seem to fit. So this is, uh, Alex is gonna, I think, put up some of the uh, prototype designs we have <laughs> on the table over there. Um, also, we found a problem with these peg nibs we were using to hold the load cells. Uh, at first, in the beginning of the year, when we had come up with this idea, we thought, hey, that's actually, might be a good idea. Uh, we don't have to use screws, and we don't have to figure out how to deal with that but uh, maybe it actually wasn't a good idea because the nibs broke very easily. At first we thought maybe if we increased the density of the infill and the 3D printer it might work and we tried that, but they still broke off very easily. Sometimes we're just carrying it around. I had some breaking off. They even broke off in the load cell. And because of this, we were never really able to even test if the load cell was able to uh, calculate the, the weight of the water above the, uh, on the top coaster piece. Yeah, so we did actually end up writing the code for it though. Um, so we have that piece, and we were able to set up a test bench where we had the load cell properly um, lined up, and we were able to find the calibration factor for it and begin um, looking into different results with that. Um, we weren't able to, unfortunately, get it working with our full product, obviously, because it required it to be fully assembled. Um, but we did find that it would be possible, at least, um, and we did find that it probably would be helpful to the user. So does it remind you to drink water? If it wasn't obvious, uh, unfortunately, our product in its current state does not remind you to drink water. <laughs> so we asked ourselves, what do we change to possibly uh, fix that so it could uh, help your mind and drink more water? And one of the biggest changes, uh, first off, would be that we'd probably remove the pegs because that would just make it so, because uh, the load cell just wouldn't even work with the peg system we had. We'd probably have to use screws. There's a nice concept drawing I pasted in here of what that might look like, where we just screw the load cells in. Uh, originally, we were afraid of using screws because we weren't sure if it would be easy to use, um, and we thought that the peg idea might actually work. Um, well, with hindsight, it does not. <laughs> also, we decide, uh, if we use screws, we wouldn't have to worry about making the parts fit together as nicely. We could make one part a lot bigger and one part a lot smaller, and that way we could work on sizing it down after that, and that way we have a working prototype instead of one that doesn't fit together and we can't even really test very well. Also, we had an idea of having a, a visual cue with a light. Um, obviously, we never got to attach it on, but if we were to continue it, we'd have some kind of audio-visual cue. We were thinking about even adding a speaker inside at some point. I also want to talk about what we learned from this whole experience, because I think it's a very important part of the process. Because in the beginning of the year, Alex or nor I have uh, really any experience with using load cells, and throughout the year, we also had to learn how to use load cells and also how to use an Arduino and learn the code for that. And also, we got experience uh, CADing and using 3D printers, and then going through this whole design process, figuring out what went wrong, and then how to fix that. We also got to work uh, on you know, managing our time and figuring out how we're gonna you know, tackle all these problems, uh, you know, in getting documentation down and everything involved with that. So, that concludes our presentation. Thank you for listening. I'm gonna open it up to questions now. Any questions? We'll be here after if anybody thinks of any. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, next up, we have a Caddy Daddy with Jordan Logar and Marquetta McCabe.
Hi, so my name is Jordan Logar, and this is Marquetta McCabe. And together, over the past year in this course, we worked on building our product, the Caddy Daddy. All right, so our problem statement for our project. It is commonly found that the amateur golfer struggles with their putt game and that the overall time to golf is excessive. A device projecting a light to expand the diameter as well as the surface area of the golf hole not only speeds up the game of golf, but also acts as a putting trainer for beginning golfers. So we were trying to use, uh, utilize this product in order to project a more appealing way to attract amateur and beginner golfers along with experts, for example, to golf outings in order for the golf game to be efficient. We both agreed on a small device to attach to the pole with lights facing downward towards the golf hole, emitting a circular, um, a circular surface through the lights around the golf hole in order to make the diameter much wider. Therefore, it's quicker to get the ball into the hole. So our reach research. What we found out is that there's no exact um, similar products out there. They're either placed at the bottom of the hole, inputted, or on top of it, but they are no longer manufactured. We also found several patents with no visual representation and only small descriptions that were very vague and misleading. We also found out that uh, adjustments of the diameter based off the individual golfer's skill set and preference would be much more efficient than having a fixed radius as these products had. We also concluded that this product design was an innovation, an, an improvement on what currently exists. The device, as I said, lightweight, small, and projects an image which has no impact on the ball or the putting surface. So for example, on the left we have what is known as a big cup. It is currently no longer manufactured and it's a struggle to purchase online. It is also really um, affordable, but it, you don't really want to drag that around if you're completing 18 holes with, say, three people. Um, yeah. So it has a fixed radius, as you can tell, and it's placed right above the um, golf hole. This creates an obstacle as it can, as you're putting the ball, it can hit the edge, as you can see, on the grass, and just stop right there. Would that count as you got the ball in the hole? We don't know. Um, so on the right is what we have, or what our product goal was. In order, a little device that's less than five pounds, to be attached to the flagpole itself, illuminating a laser rim around the hole. So addressing the problem. The average time to play a game of golf varies, but statistically what we, in our, we found in our research that a typical game lasts four to five hours. But in the surveys that we sent out, our, we received back that more than 50% said that it takes more than five hours golfing. 10% of that factor were people responding back that it takes them more than six hours, which let's be honest, we don't wanna be out there golfing for more than six hours. We would wanna off, shave off the time it takes for each hole. Say five minutes um, off of each hole, that takes, do the math yourself. I can't do it on the spot. <laughs> Um, we also found out that 50% of, 55 percent of people struggle with their short game. In my personal experience, that's most of the time I take while playing a hole. Um, 60 percent also responded back that they wish golfing took less time. Our objective, which is supported by that claim, is to shorten the time that it takes to complete 18 holes. So in order to achieve our goal, we knew that we had to design a portable device that would attach and reattach to the golf flagpole. So here are our needs and wants. We both agreed on that it should be portable, better than carrying around the big cup, let's be honest. Um, easy to attach and remove from the pole, as I've repeatedly said. Weigh less than five pounds and affordable. So this would be utilized to 
beginners, amateurs, and even experts, but it's more cost efficient for anybody to be able to get their hands on. We needed the product to emit visible light, widen diameter, remain stable at set heights in order so you can adjust the diameter according to your own preference, and water resistant due to certain weather conditions, and durable because you're carrying it around the entire day. So on to our designing process. So I'm just going to explain our product real quick uh, with all the parts and components. <coughs> so our product is um, two plastic casings put together. Um, yes. We have um, 10 LED lights configured in a circle um, and uh, on and off switch on the back. Um, it's connected with a hinge. And original, originally our design was to have it um, closed with magnets. But due to t um, time constraints, we used a hook instead. Um, and as you can see, it lights up to emit light, and it's supposed to um, clip on to the flagpole like that and then shine on the ground. Um, the one thing that we didn't do is have the lights facing outwards um, to project a, a larger circle. Um, again, due to c time constraints, um, we had some problems with the 3D printer. Um, yeah. um, so this is our AutoCAD drawing. Um, this is our AutoCAD drawing. So um, you can see it's the circular um, formation of 3D uh, LED lights. Um, we originally didn't have the two uh, casings put together. Uh, we needed that to make it hollow in the center for the wiring um, of the LED lights. Um, so in the process of designing, we realized that we put we were putting less emphasis on expanding the golf, the golf hole diameter and more on um, being able to see the golf hole uh, either if you're in, in uh, bad weather or if it's getting darker, if you have bad eyesight, like um, anything, the lights should help you see the hole better um, so you have a better aim. Um, so now I'm gonna talk about constructing the Caddy Daddy. So again, we encountered some um, difficulties with the 3D printer. Um, so with the scaling, we did uh, scale some of the parts incorrectly so they didn't fit together initially. Um, so we did have to play around with the 3D printer, um, get, to, uh, get, get used to it as we went on because we weren't actually that experienced with it before we started this project. Um, another problem we had was the 3D printer was um, releasing of excess material into the, um, the holes where the LEDs were supposed to go, so we did need to drill through those, but that was an easy fix. Um, so testing, we did test it for durability and uh, water, waterproof. So uh, the durability, I pretty much carried it around all week. I dropped it a few times. It had no issues. Um, it's pretty much, it's very solid and um, yeah, I've had no issues with it like falling apart or anything. Um, and the water resistance, we poured water on it several times to test it and it was safe every time. Um, we had no issues with that either, which is important if you're going to be playing golf outside. This is just a better look at our prototype. And now we're gonna uh, reflect on our experiences. We definitely uh, learned a lot over this project. It was a whole year of working together. And um, again, with the LED lights, they were supposed to be pointing outwards. Um, if we had more time, then we would most likely be able to uh, figure out the 3D printer better in order to make this happen um, because that was our only constraint there. Um, and we did have uh, some issues with testing just because of the time constraints again. So if we had more time, we would have done more testing. Um, but it was mostly, we, we had pretty much all positive experiences during this. Uh, we learned a lot. And also, we pretty much, I would say, perfected the programs we were using as we went on because they were very difficult at first to figure out with CAD and Inventor and then the um, MakerBot when we were printing. It was all very confusing at first, but um, Mr. Harris helped us out a lot with that, so that was really helpful. And now we pretty much know how to do it ourselves. Um, does anyone have any questions? Yes. So due to us mainly focusing our time on 3D printing, since that was our 
biggest struggle there. Um, we were aiming for approximately twenty to twenty-five dollars, as it would be pretty cheap to build it like sell. And based on our first, first survey that we sent out, we also asked at very various price points what you think you would spend on a product like this, and most people said anywhere from $15 to $25, so that would be our price range to sell. Um, so in order to improve our product with that issue that we incurred, we would add a rubber, some sort of rubber casing on the center of our product in order for it to stay stable at a set height. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Rake 2.0 with Dan Smith, Max Rebstock, and Max Sybin. Hi everyone, I'm Dan Smith. With me today are Max Zubin Mosicki and Max Rebstock, and together we are MDM Rigs. For our idea, we came up with this. Uh, our inspiration came over the last two years working together um, during the fall, cleaning leaves up around Medford and Medford Lakes, and we continuously ran into the problem of clogged leaves at the bottom end of the rake. And to uh, fix this, we created our problem statement, which stated how we had uh, it's extremely ineffective right now, and there has been no build modifications to any sort of rake to help this, or at least that are in production. And this will definitely help uh, ease the strain on people's backs, as well as for older people. All right, so for our research, we ran into this problem, and it's pretty obvious that no one wants to rake leaves. And so to make that easier for everyone, uh, we decided that we would come up with a product that would make it a little bit easier on your back and so you don't have to bend down, push leaves off rakes like every single time you use your rake. And so we did a couple surveys. The first one is, does your rake ever get clogged? And overwhelmingly, yes, it does. And also everyone said that it is a major hassle to rake leaves. And for more surveys, we had how often do you rake leaves? Most people do it once a year. Some people do it a little bit more. I don't know why. Um, and. And most people did think it would be helpful to have an attachment to push out excessive leaves, which is why we did build our rake. And then we added it to a plastic rake because that would help push leaves. And overwhelmingly, people do use plastic rakes more than they had used metal rakes or hard metal rakes, stuff like that. And so there are prior solutions. People did attempt to solve this problem. And so on the left there is a rake that they built an entirely new rake handle, tines, the whole deal, and it would help to push leaves of the rake. So that was a good idea. It would solve our problem, but our goal was to make something that attached to a rake that already existed so that people wouldn't have to go out and buy an entirely new rake. And on the one on the right, that was for a hard metal rake, so that's more for mulching, stuff like that. So that wouldn't really solve our problem. No one really uses those type of rakes to, um, to rake leaves. All right, so when we began the design process, we first thought of a few, um, a few specifications that we wanted our device to have. We didn't really have a product in mind yet. We didn't really have any concepts, so we were just brainstorming out loud here. So a few things we decided the product needed to be able to do is, first and foremost, it has to remove stuck leaves and any debris from a rake. That is our main problem statement. That's what we want to address. Secondly, we want it to connect with all leaf rakes, or as much as we can possibly do that, because there is a wide variation. We also want it to be cost effective and durable. We thought those were two very important things. And now for our wants, these are more negotiable things that we thought our product should have. So first of all, we thought it should be aesthetically pleasing. We also thought it should be operated with one hand, or at least you could have the option to do that, and with an adjustable handle height as well. Now here are two concept sketches that we came up with in the beginning of the process as well. So these are, these are concepts for a product that would attach to a rake. They're not for an actual new rake itself. So that's what we decided to do. So for our first concept sketch on the left, we have 
we have a design where fingers or uh, finger-like devices push through the tines of a rake, and that's how we would remove the debris. And then the design on the right, which is what our design actually ended up looking more like, this is where a, um, a parallel, a horizontal bar would push the debris out, as shown here, which is what we actually ended up with. So our prototype design, as you can see right here, we called it the Rake 2.0. And it was comprised mainly of a PVC pipe, three 3D printed parts, and thermoplastics, along with a few attachments. So, um, as you can see here, compared to a normal rake, this is the rake fitted with our attachment prototype. So, as you can see, we have the PVC pipe, which you would push down from a standing position. This connects to three 3D printed parts around a spring, which uh, helps it rem uh, come back to its original position. And then these attach to four sheets of thermoplastics. The thermoplastics are what actually come into contact with the leaves, and they are um, fitted to the curvature of the rake itself. So um, the total amount of parts cost about $27, plus the 3D printing filament, which I'm unsure about the cost. But if we were to uh, man manufacture this ourselves, we think we could bring the price down a bit. So these are pretty much uh, the CAD drawing files of our the 3D printed things that I designed. And so these are the two things that went around the rake and then connected to the PVC. And so that also connects to the springs. The springs help to release it back up so you don't have to pull up and down, up and down. It would just release back to the resting position. And this is what I made as a piece to transition from the PVC to uh, the thermoplastic that would actually be pushing the leaves off. And I think that was a good idea because I had no other way of transitioning the two things and it works well. And so for testing, we had four different tests. We had a durability test and then three different tests with one just being pine needles, one just being leaves, and then the third being them both mixed. Throughout all the tests, it performed well. It uh, did not break during multiple drops from meter high heights, as well as it also bends properly. And then it also uh, gets rid of all the leaves as continue one more. As you can see in this video. It pushes all the uh, stuck leaves out from the rake spindles. And one more time. There we go. All right, so at this point in the game, we had made a product and it had satisfied our initial problem statement. So we looked back at our design needs and design wants in terms of what we had actually accomplished and what fell short. So as you can see, it does remove stuck leaves and all debris from a rake, and it does connect with all leaf rakes, although the process of taking it off and putting it on another one is a little slower than we would have liked. Now it is durable, as you, can, as you uh, have explained by the durability test, but it is not that cost effective yet. That can be fixed. It's not aesthetically pleasing. Again, that can be fixed if we change the materials and have one integrated um, sheet of thermoplastics, but it can be operated with one hand. And unfortunately, it doesn't have an adjustable handle height, but again, that was negotiable in the beginning. So a few small issues that we did run into is, first and foremost, the um, PVC pipe here is very heavy, and that makes it a little uncomfortable to use. So in the future, we would decide to use either a different material. We could change the outside diameter of the PVC to use less material in itself or we could just make it shorter. So all of those things, the PVC is what mostly contributes to the heavy uh, weight. So another improvement we can make is to put a rubber stopper right here, which limits the range of motion from actually exceeding that point. Now we would do this because sometimes the springs get unattached and they can fall out. So overall, this is an awesome year and the past four years have been great and it really helped us to learn about engineering, learn how to like go through the design process. One thing that was really interesting for us that we learned during this past year is that we have our product here, but most of the year we spend time researching and doing other things other than actually just building the product. And it obviously worked because all four of us, all three of us are studying engineering next year. And so that's our presentation. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? It um, slides pretty smoothly up and down, and it's also able to be used with one hand. It's, uh, the outside diameter is thick enough up here, which also contributes to why it's so heavy, but it makes it tightly wrapped 
to the actual thing so there wouldn't be any uh, pinching or anything like towards your hand. Any more questions? All right, thank you. All right, so up next we have Cup Cap with Pilar Nieves, Mark Voorhees, and Matthew Mason. Okay, so the three of us are part of the Cup of Cap team. I am Pilar Nieves. This is Matthew Mason and Mark Voorhees. Okay, so our inspiration for our product was uh, in our lives we found that uh, an issue we had was uh, uh, drinks, uh, especially hot drinks, uh, coffee, hot chocolate, things of that nature. Uh, spilling out of uh, holes in the tops of cups or alternatively just spilling over from the cup getting knocked over. Uh, and this is, this is annoying in a daily context because it's a spill, you're going to have to clean up. Um, but it also has a much more serious context of a lot of people get uh, really bad burns from things like coffee and hot beverages. Uh, and that is an actual serious problem uh, in America, as Mark will uh, detail. All right, so our problem statement was that every year in the USA alone, uh, the American Bird Association states that there are over 100,000 burns um, caused by coffee or, or similar hot beverages. And uh, the crucial problem is that these spills are commonly caused by shaking or bumping uh, the cup during walking or driving. So our solution would be a reusable drinking cap um, that can fit a wide variety of any commercially available hot beverage cup. So again, the majority of the beginning of our project was just researching the information. We found that, um, so we found that a lot of the issues that come with how cups spill over is that actually the angle of the lids of coffee cups can actually amplify the splash depending on the curvature of the top cap, which is a major problem. We also found that spilling coffee, of course, negatively affects productivity. You aren't as productive if you've spilt coffee or another type of hot beverage, beverage on yourself. It provides a major distraction in the workplace and in school. We also found that there is definitely a public need for a method to prevent splashing because I find that spilling liquids in school or in other places is a detriment to the public well-being. You never want to go into school, you sit down in the desk, put your backpack down, and find that there is some coffee spill underneath you. Not a fun time. Also, there are a lot of growing environmental concerns over the use of single-use plastics. A lot of what we'll de detail later is that a lot of the solutions to plug the drink holes are single-use plastics, such as the Starbucks splash sticks, which just go straight into the landfills. They are not reusable. We also found out that some cities, such as San Francisco is one example, they want to ban single-use plastics, such as the Starbucks splash stick, by the year 2020. So again, we put out a survey. The survey participants were mostly high school age students from the age of 17 to about, I mean from the age of about 12 to 24. So again, we have to take a look at that when we look at the bias of our answers. We found that the majority, over 50% of participants, have experienced spills while inside a car vehicle that can provide a major distraction while on the road. I know a friend who spilled a cup and almost crashed their car. Um, a majority, again, over 50% of our survey participants have experienced burns or even frequent burns at the hands of coffee. We also found that, again, 71%, way over 50% of survey participants have not used a spill stopping device in the form of a beverage plug. So there's a lot of people who do not have methods to plug their beverage ad beverages adequately. Um, lastly, we found that a majority of people consume 
hot beverages one to three times a week. This shows that there is a large market of people who need a way to plug their beverages. Okay, so some of the previous uh, examples of products that are meant to uh, stop spilling is uh, the first one, Sticks to Go, is the sort of brand name. But if you are a frequent uh, customer at Starbucks, you're going to recognize them as the little uh, green sticks that are meant to go in the small hole in the top of the uh, cup. They're called splash sticks, hot stoppers. Uh, they're a pretty typical product that you can find. Uh, the issue with them is, is that while they stop uh, splashing, uh, from outside of that, or from that hole. What they don't do is they don't prevent from uh, the spilling of liquids if you're completely knocking over the cup. Uh, and in addition, they are a single-use uh, plastic product. So that, uh, not only is that bad for the environment, but it also might not be sticking around for so long as uh, restrictions get uh, greater on what you can use in the terms of plastics. Uh, another solution would be the Spillinator, uh, which was a product uh, advertised to basically, uh, it was an insert that would be put into the hole of the cup. Uh, and it would uh, allow you to drink out of it while preventing any spills. Um, while, while that is the goal that we were trying to achieve, uh, this was a, basically a, a Kickstarter product online, and it never actually went into production, and there were a lot of claims online that it was a scam and not real. Uh, so obviously that's not going to fit our needs. So we, again, before we started drawing our physical designs and making our designs, we wrote down a list of needs, things that we absolutely had to have our prototype be able to do. Our first need was, of course, we, need to, we needed our product to keep the lid from falling off. We needed our product to have an adjustable cap filter so it would be able to be used with a large variety of hot beverage containers. We also need the solution to fit almost all commercially available hot beverage containers, both the ones that are reusable, such as this Starbucks cup, which does not have any method of stopping spills, and those that are just single-use commercially available ones that you get normally. Um, we also need our product, since it is meant to be reusable, you need to clean it in between uses, so that was a major need. We also had that the concern with using plastics is that we need to choose a plastic material that would not contaminate the drink by leaching BPA or any other plastic chemicals into the drink when it was exposed to high temperatures. We also needed the solution to be reasonably priced. If people use drink coffee multiple times a week, as we saw one to three times a week is where the amount of times most people drink coffee from our survey, they should have multiple forms of our product so they can reuse it, so they can use it multiple times. Maybe have two was our goal. We, now these are our design specifications, our wants. They are not necessary, but it'd be greatly appreciated if our design could include these. We wanted the product not only to be able to be cleaned, but to be cleaned in the dishwasher, which is a lot less intensive on the individual and less time consuming, but the dishwasher cleaning is a lot more intense on the product. We also wanted our cup to be environmentally friendly using a type of plastic that was sustainable, you know. We also wanted the solution to be visually appealing to customers as the style of cups would make people want to use it even more. So each of us drew up uh, drawings for our designs, a couple different designs each. Mine, um, they're all based off the lid, so each design had a three inch diameter lid with a lever um, a lever that would block the hole to prevent spills. However, each design varied in how it would attach itself to the cup. One design just had clamps that would screw on. One design was a sock type of uh, design that would just uh, clamp onto the, uh, the elasticity would just hold the lid to the cup itself. And the final design was a string that would be tied around the lid and hold the lid to the cup. Okay, so my designs were a little bit more uh, complex uh, than Mark's. I had basically a series of either clamps or straps uh, to go around the entire cup. Uh, it would have, I think, held it on, but it was uh, too complex to make uh, effectively, and it was, uh, it was too specific to one size of cup. 
So these are my engineering sketches of the design. I focused more on a device to plug the hole that you use to drink out of the cups versus something that covered the whole cup, as you can see through my various designs. So in the end, we all decided to do the design that had a sock on it, a sock type of product that would secure the lid itself to the cup and prevent any spills. Okay, so once we had our uh, basic design figured out, I modeled it in our CAD software. Uh, and so on this slide, you can see the basic, uh, the lid, it's a three inch diameter uh, circular part that provides a firm basis uh, for the drink uh, and to uh, contain it within. Uh, and here is our uh, lever arm, which will basically uh, rotate uh, full 180 degrees uh, so that it can plug into the hole to stop any spills uh, when it's in its plug position, but it all can also uh, rotate completely out of the way so that you can uh, have full access to the hole when you are going to actually drink. So as Matt was designing our cup of cap lid and lever in the Autodesk software, I was performing mathematical calculations to determine how much weight our cup should, the lid will need to hold when turned upside down. So I basically Googled looking at the most popular um, stores that we expect our customers to buy beverages from, from our survey responses. I found that McDonald's, Wawa, Dunkin' Donuts, and Starbucks were the most popular places to buy hot beverages. I then looked at all the available fluid ounce options that they offer in their cups, and then I repeated them in fluid ounces. So then I converted each fluid ounce to kilograms, which is a lot easier for using uh, mathematical calculations. I found that about one fluid ounce equals 0 0.03 kilograms. So I converted them all to, I converted the data set into kilograms before proceeding to the next step, where I tried to determine the force of tension that the lid would have to withstand. Now, I assume that when the cup would be turned upside down, the full weight of the water would be pressing down on the lid. In order for the lid to stay on, the force of tension of the lid would have to be equal or greater than the force of gravity of the water. So by finding the force of gravity of the water, I then knew how much the force of tension our cup would have to be able to hold, as seen in the free body diagram. And so, then after doing the physics, cal physics calculations, I then found that the maximum force of tension that we would need our cup of cap to be able to have would be 0.99 newtons. All right, so in the end, um, Matt and I built our final product. Um, so as you can see in the left photo, that's an aerial view of the lid and the lever mechanism. On, on the right side is the sock method, the sock portion. The base of that has a much lower diameter than the lid. That way it would clamp on to the cup itself. Um, our product was in the middle of testing and did not make it to this presentation. So we have an earlier prototype with us today. Um, it included a lever arm that would block the hole, as well as the sock portion that would clamp around, clamp around any cup and, el and elasticize itself to the cup. So. Okay, and so for testing, uh, we tested a few things. Our testing was a, a mixed bag of results, as we'll get to. Um, so first of all was durability, uh, and this was, uh, is the product going to break? Uh, we, I had it in my backpack uh, for a long time, going out th throughout the school day. Uh, Pilar carried it around for a long time too, so I think that emulated uh, normal usage uh, pretty well of you carrying it around uh, so that you'd be able to use it when you are getting your beverages. Uh, and it uh, completely remained sturdy, it did not break, uh, it was uh, stable in that regard. And in addition to the durability test, we tested it with hot water uh, to see if it could be cleaned, and uh, it, was, uh, it worked well with that. Um, one issue was that our waterproof fabric was uh, water resistant on one side and the other side it would sort of uh, absorb a lot of moisture uh, which made it difficult to uh, use again uh, directly after cleaning because it would still be uh, wet and hard to get onto uh, a new cup. 
Uh, we could uh, have gotten a new fabric to avoid that, though. So I would say overall we passed durability testing. Uh, the grip test is to see whether or not the sock itself would adhere to cups of uh, different sizes. And that was a pass on our uh, prototype that is not that one. Uh, it completely, it passed all of them. Uh, typical uh, coffee cup sizes from four different uh, chains that we mentioned earlier. Uh, it was able to stick to all of those uh, very well. Okay, so we have our gravity test, which is similar to our grip test in that we would, we would put it on the cup and then we would flip it upside down uh, with liquid in it. Uh, to see if it would be able to uh, withstand those forces and not fall right off. Uh, that would not be good. Luckily for us, it did not fall right off. It uh, held sturdy uh, in that position, so that was a success. Um, our main test, the most important thing, uh, unfortunately, was the spill test, uh, which did not go exactly to plan. Uh, it did halt um, the uh, flow of water out of, or, or water or uh, uh, the liquids that we would test it with. Um, when we uh, would put it like sideways or upside down, it did make the flow a lot slower, but there was still water uh, leaking out of it, which was obviously uh, an issue considering that was uh, our goal was to prevent that. Um, I think that, uh, going to reflections, I think that the main problem with uh, why we got so much spillage was because the 3D printed parts, uh, we wanted the lever to fit very snugly into the hole uh, so that it would make a seal and so that uh, no liquid could come out. Our three printed parts, when we uh, made them, they were either uh, basically the lever was too big and it couldn't fit in that hole, or if it was too small and the water could just go right past it. Uh, so it would be possible, I believe, to construct them in a better way. Uh, to uh, I think the design would work if we constructed it better so that it would not spill out that hole, uh, considering the testing that we saw uh, reducing the flow. Uh, but it wasn't possible in our time frame because we only realized this very uh, recently uh, as it took a long time to 3D print our parts as there were some issues with the printer, definitely. A few other changes we would have to our product would be to, um, to make the lid smaller. We had a three inch diameter, thinking that would cover every single commercially, um, commercially available hot, hot beverage cup, and it did. However, it was a bit too big. It would be much better to use a two and a half inch uh, diameter lid would have prevented less spilling. And finally, we, we would have used a more elastic material for the sock portion. A current portion, um, while it is waterproof and it has good grip on it, it could have had a much better grip and you could basically swing around any way possible and it would never spill. So that would have been, would have been helpful. Okay, so uh, can we field any questions, please? Yeah. Uh, so you go about it two ways. Uh, if you're in a car. For example, uh, the question is basically, was it difficult to align the whole of the cap of the product with the cap on the cup? Is that correct? Yes. Um, so if you're in a scenario like a car uh, and you're not necessarily feeling comfortable taking the whole cap off, uh, it would, um, you would have to take that into consideration when you put the cap on. It's possible. Um, it's just something actually that you need to consider. Another possibility is if you have a fermentive cup, you can take the whole lid off and then put this one in replacement. Uh, obviously, that would be in a more controlled setting uh, where you know that you're not going to burn yourself uh, spilling uh, if you spill it accidentally. Uh, but either of those is possible, and it is possible to use them in both ways. It would be consumer preference as to what they wish to do. Uh, so basically what we do is um, we put the uh, sock itself around the, uh, uh, the cup and it creates a strong enough seal that um, the beverage never really comes into contact uh, with, the, uh, with the sock itself uh, below the level of the cup. Okay, so I don't believe there are any more questions. Uh, thank you. We were cup of cap. Next, we have Everbalance with Brendan, Brian, and James.
Okay, so uh, I'm James. My partners are Brian and Brendan, and together we uh, formed Everbounce. So um, basically, when we were coming up with a problem, I was playing a lot of tennis at the time, and uh, one of the problems that I personally experienced was flat tennis balls, so we decided to tackle that. Um, tennis balls are different from other balls because they don't have a valve where you can just, you know, stick a needle in and pump it back up. The only thing that keeps these pressurized and bouncy is the initial canister that they come in, which is pressurized itself. So, like, when you, when you open up a tennis can like that, you can hear the pressure is literally coming out. So, the more you use, you can't store it back in this can. So, basically, our problem statement in summary is just we need to create a device where we can put these balls back in pressure so that we can play with the tennis balls pressurized. And um, another aspect we figured we would throw in, which would be nice, is um, these are very common uh, tennis ball holders, and they just very easily pick up tennis balls for when you're done your playing. So we wanted to incorporate that design into our project. Um, and these are just two uh, like quotes that kind of show that uh, this is needed. People feel that flat tennis balls are a problem. Um, they're saying that uh, the balls are becoming depressurized before uh, they become fuzzy and the balls actually deteriorate, deteriorate, meaning the balls have more life, they're just not pressurized. Um, and the second quote is from a 3.5 level player, which is an average tennis player. So it shows that really anyone uh, could benefit from this product. So here are some initial designs of our um, product and what is incorporated with our design. So here is a patent that has a built-in pump right here. And it also um, contains a pressure gauge, which is right there. So uh, how ours is different is um, this, can, or this cap can only store three balls because it goes on a standard tennis can. It's very bulky and it does not have a ball hop included. And this is another similar product which has a patent. It's also a pump on the top. It does not have a pressure gauge. It only holds three balls and it does not have a ball hub. Okay, so our product would really have two main impacts on society. And the first impact would be it would save tennis players a lot of money because the average tennis player or competitive tennis player buys a new can about every time they play a match. So if they could lengthen the life of a tennis ball by keeping them in a pressurized canister. They wouldn't have to buy balls as often. And obviously that um, the amount of balls that are bought adds up because that stat says 125 million balls are bought per year. And that doesn't even add up in cost. It also is very bad for the environment because most of these balls end up in landfills. So if we could reduce the amount of balls bought, it would save money and reduce the amount of balls in landfills because a tennis ball takes about 450 years to deteriorate. So to help with our research process, we released a survey to our classmates and people on the boys and girls tennis team. And we highlight some of the important questions here. So the first question was, would you even recognize the difference between a properly pressurized tennis ball and a dead tennis ball? And because if, if you couldn't recognize that and not enough people recognize that, there would be no point in this product. So thankfully, like two thirds of people rec would recognize the difference. And then the second one we wanted to, second important question was who has been impacted? So about half the people surveyed have been impacted, which shows us that it's a pretty common problem. And then another question that we asked to help us with the design process was, as a user, would you rather have the lid the pump attached to the lid or the pump separately? And most people said they'd rather have the pump separately, so that's what we incorporated in our design. So for our product, we needed some needs and wants to be incorporated. So a need is that we wanted a gauge to indicate the pressure inside the tube, and which needed to be about 14.5, which is the standard pressure inside of a tennis ball. We also needed a Schrader valve to go on top of the cap, which is a standard valve that goes on a bike pump, which is most commonly used around the household. And uh, we needed the tube to hold around 14, 14.5 PSI. So once we needed this to be cost effective so that many people can use this product, so it can be durable, so um, when it's used around like the tennis courts or like stored in your house, then it won't break. Lightweight, so it can be carried to the courts and from the courts and easy to store so it doesn't take up too much space. Uh, for some designs, we initially started as just having a cap to go off of, so this is my design. As you can see, there's a sh uh, pressure gauge right there and a Schrader valve right there. Uh, I also came up with a clip on the side that is supposed to be um, able to hold a handheld bike pump, but we didn't include that in the final design. 
So this is my design, and mine was designed to fit on a standard tennis can, one like James just opened, and it's similar to B. Scott's. It has a pressure gauge on top and a Schrader valve on top, and it's a two-piece design with a permanent part on the bottom and then a screw on the top so it stays pressurized. Um, my design is very similar to Brian's. It's uh, meant to fit on a normal tennis can that you open to make it easy to use. The only difference is um, it's attached to the can using a silicone sleeve, um, which in hindsight definitely wouldn't work with what we learned about how hard it is to pressurize. Um, but it would include the Schrader valve and the pressure gauge just like the other ones. And it's also two components, so you can screw off the top part so you can take the balls in and out. And we use a decision matrix to see which cap would be the best use for our design. And we came to the conclusion that mine would be the best because it is a screw on cap to a different canister and that it has all the components that we needed to include. So after we decided to use Brendan's design, we made an inventor part file and drawing file to give us a more three-dimensional view of what the product would really look like. So displayed to the left right now is what the cap would look like. And you can see the threads in the cap. And then to the right of the cap is the ball hop feature, which we 3D printed and cut into pieces. And then we put it in the inside of the cap so you could push down on the, uh, on the can and balls would come up and not come back down. And then this is the base of our product. So you can see it's pretty similar to this right here. It has the threads on the top and bottom, which would be screwed on. And then it's pretty long, so it can hold a decent amount of tennis balls. So this is, this is one of our final prototypes. So the top and, uh, yeah, James will um, demonstrate it for you. So the top and bottom are both PVC thread, while the base is made of polycarbonate, which made it very difficult to bind together because you couldn't use typical PVC primer and cement. So we had a lot of problems um, pressurizing this one, but we were able to add the ball hop feature, which was a plus. And we, to, to try and seal up the uh, polycarbonate with the PVC, we used many different methods, including epoxy putty, uh, just electrical tape, but none of them really made it airtight. While they worked for a certain amount of time, it would always leak out. So this is our other final design. So for this one, we used a larger PVC tube. So we initially um, had a capping for the bottom. So you can see here that we used PVC primer and cement to make a more stable um, part of the canister. It does not have a ball hop on that one because this one was more used to be storing in like your garage or somewhere in your house. And also um, the top, um, Fitting is also used with primer and cement. And this is just demonstrating putting the pump onto the Schrader valve, which fits with any bike pump or a portable pump even. It's just more effective. And this is just all you'd have to do to put pressure into it. Um, you can't really see it, but the gauge is going up and pressure is building inside, which uh, theoretically would pressurize the tennis balls over time and keep it nice and fresh. And then you can just take it off. And then if you want to release the pressure when you're taking it off, you just press down on the Schrader valve. And I don't know if you can hear that, but air is releasing, which would make it safe to take it off. Oh yeah, okay. So, um, so the first test we conducted was the pressure test. And uh, this was using the clear container because that was our first model with the uh, polycarbonate tube. Um, so this is where we filled it to 14 PSI, and this is just our first test. So the air leaked out in like about 10 seconds. It really didn't hold it. Um, but this is because we, we weren't able to use PVC on PVC and use just primer, which would actually bond the PVC together and break it down and make it one. So instead, we used epoxy putty, which we didn't use very well, and it like left cracks, so the air escaped. Um, the second test we did was using the new PVC pipe, uh, which, again, we were able to use the primer and cement, which actually broke down the uh, PVC components and physically welded them together. So those were airtight. Um, and that held for all of class. Uh, we came the next day and it did drain. So it's, it could have held for an hour or 23 hours. We don't know for sure. But it, it did work, not for the whole time. And the problem we ran into was the, um, the threads where the cap went on. That is... Uh, where we identified the pressure leakage. 
Um, and then recently we did a third test with the clear one again because it's more visually appealing uh, as it's clear. And we, uh, we attempted to do a better job with the epoxy putty. Um, and we used plumber's tape on the threads to try to counteract the pressure leakage in the threads. Um, and we put it up to 14 PSI and the epoxy putty didn't hold. So uh, it, while it did have the ball hop feature, uh, the white PVC one was far more effective in holding pressure. So another test we wanted to conduct was a bounce test. And our original plan for the bounce test was we were going to open a new can of tennis balls and then bounce all three and take an average of the height. And then we would store one of the tennis balls in our prototype, another tennis ball in a standard tennis can, and another tennis ball in the open air. Then like throughout the week, we would play with them like a normal tennis player would. And then after two weeks to a month of putting it through normal wear and tear of a tennis ball, we would rebounce them. And then we would find the average of those sites. But that was before we knew that our prototype would only be able to hold pressure for about 24 hours or less. So we still conducted the bounce test. And for the first drop, we did exactly what we planned on. We opened a new can of tennis balls. And we found that the average bounce height was about 38 inches. And then even though we weren't able to store the tennis balls in our prototype, we conducted the same bounce test about two weeks later, and we found that the average height was about an inch and a little over an inch less than it was the week two weeks before, which just goes to show um, how quickly tennis balls can lose their pressure and bounce. We also conducted a drop test, which is a durability test for the actual canisters. So we did five drops um, with the canister vertical, and we just dropped it to its normal length and. Uh, we were pretty unsuccessful with that because on the cap and canister there was scratches and nicks. Also with the pressure gauge, it got knocked so hard that it actually held its uh, indicator at 3 PSI, which is not supposed to be uh, correct. Um, so in summary, uh, one of the main things we learned while doing this is it's like incredibly difficult to use PVC materials or any of these materials to hold pressure. Um, like I said, the problem we were running into is the threads uh, were releasing the pressure. The problem is PVC threads are manufactured to be tapered, so the closer the cap gets to the base, the wider it gets. So the cap never actually hits the base of the fitting where it would come into contact with the O-ring to make a pressure seal. So because we weren't able to do this, we tried cutting it to try to shorten the distance. That didn't really work. It worked a little bit. Um, but we might want to look into new material. Uh, brass fittings, I'm told, are not uh, tapered, but that might not bond well to the PVC. Um, also, another option would have been a boat plug, which you just twist, and it's supposed to be airtight. Um, another thing we realize is it's better to go in store to get your fittings and the caps, because you can just make sure everything works. When you order things online, sometimes, uh, they don't come in right as you expected, but, uh, but yeah. Um, we also just learned a lot about working in a group and group work and uh, time management and overall it's a really valuable project that I think is going to uh, really help us transition to college. Um, and yeah, so uh, I'm going to thank you for your time and if you have any questions, feel free. All right, thank you. All right, now we're going to bring in Mr. Harris for the closing remarks. And I think I can speak for everyone when I said that he played a huge part in all our projects and did a really good job for his first year, so give it up for him. All right, once again, thank you for all taking time out of the busy lives. I know it can be a little difficult to get here. I know the weather scared me as it was pouring down rain. I thought roads were going to be flooded and this it was going to be canceled or something. But um, a special thank you to um, Mrs. Pulliam, Mr. Fields, and Mrs. Burson for being such a helpful part of this program. So another round of applause for them, please. And then special thanks to the students, you guys. Congratulations for being the first ones through this program. I know it's been a, a lot of hard work on your part, so another round of applause for you guys as well.
And I know you're all going to hate me when, you, when I say this, but we still have more work to do, so don't forget your engineer's notebooks for next class. <laughs> all right, now uh, group photo time? All right, now a um, little picture time for everybody, so if all you guys could come up for a group photo. So parents and everybody, come up for a photo.